<laughs> okay, morning everybody. So this morning we have uh, three speakers coming from uh, Paris, uh, Jean Zé Center, and they are going to tell you about uh, NLP at scale uh, on the infrastructure. So I, so you might remember Nathan who came a few weeks ago. So he will be the one starting. Hello everyone. So. Um uh, my name is Nathan Cassero and I'm with uh, my colleagues uh, Pierre Cornet and Atim Borfun. And uh, we are engineers at Idris uh, with, uh, for the AI support team. So the Id uh, Idris is uh, the institute and we'll be talking about uh, Jean Zay, which is uh, the supercomputer. Uh, so at first I will uh, talk about uh, Jean Zay and Idris and then later on uh, Atim and Pierre will talk about uh, NLP more specifically. Uh, so Idris is uh, a CN, uh, CNRS uh, institute. Uh, it is the institute uh, which uh, hosts uh, supercomputers uh, for uh, the research center. Um, and uh, the idea is to uh, put uh, res uh, resources in common for uh, AI and uh, per high performance computing uh, researchers. So uh, the, the supercomputer is owned by GenC. Uh, GenC is a national company, so it is owned by uh, CNRS, INRIA, uh, CEA, and so on and so forth. And uh, it uh, buys uh, every uh, supercomputer in France, uh, any major supercomputer in France. Uh, and it also uh, gives uh, resources uh, to researchers and teams. So uh, if you want to have access to one of their supercomputers, uh, you will go through their uh, procedure uh, to uh, ask for uh, resources. So basically, uh, the, uh, the story of Jean Zay uh, started in uh, 2018 uh, when uh, uh, Cédric Villani, uh, working for uh, the president, uh, decided that uh, uh, wrote a report uh, saying that uh, in France we were lacking uh, research uh, facilities uh, for artificial intelligence and uh, computing uh, resources. So uh, he basically said that uh, we needed uh, new supercomputers and uh, Gen C uh, would be uh, the best uh, organization to, uh, to uh, purchase uh, the machine and uh, it could be then hosted by Idris. And then in 2018, uh, uh, we started to, uh, to uh, publish uh, uh, calls uh, for uh, any company who would sell the supercomputers and the idea would be to have a supercomputer which was both for HPC and AI. Uh, before uh, Jean Zay, uh, supercomputers were mostly for HPC uh, and not really for AI, but after the report it was decided that uh, a good portion uh, of, uh, of the machine would be dedicated to artificial intelligence because it would be a, a very important thing uh, in, uh, in 2020. And then a, late, uh, a year later, uh, Jean Zay uh, was purchased. So um, Jean Zay uh, is a minister of education uh, a long time ago and he created uh, CNRS. Uh, that's why the supercomputer was named after, uh, after, after him. So in France, there are three major supercomputers. There are uh, many more uh, supercomputers uh, which are uh, smaller, but uh, the three bigger ones uh, are Jean Zay, uh, Joliot Curie for CEA and uh, Ad Astra for uh, CNES in uh, Montpellier. Uh, so uh, Jean Zay uh, was bought in 2019 and uh, was the biggest one until uh, Ad Astra was purchased. And uh, since 2022, it is the largest uh, supercomputer in France, uh, but it is mostly dedicated to HPC and not as much for artificial intelligence. So for artificial intelligence, uh, Jean Zay is still the most powerful. And uh, so the compute power of uh, Jean Zay comes from uh, mostly its GPU. So for artificial intelligence and uh, mainly uh, NLP, you, uh, you need a lot of GPUs and uh, we have a lot of them. So we have more than 3,000 uh, 3, GPUs, uh, mostly V100 GPUs, but we also have 400 A100 GPUs uh, with uh, 80 gigabytes of memory. Uh, for the biggest model, you may need to train uh, for uh, natural language processing. Uh, and it, uh, 
it uses uh, a bit more than two me megawatts, but uh, most uh, a small part of it uh, is actually used to uh, to heat our building uh, as well as uh, the university. So uh, we do, uh, even though uh, we uh, use uh, uh, 20 uh, megawatt uh, hour per year, uh, we uh, we use 20% uh, of it, and the rest is uh, wasted. Uh, but uh, the, the fact that you can use uh, a supercomputer means that uh, also uh, the, um, the uh, hardware is shared among users, so uh, you will uh, save uh, a lot of money by uh, using Janze. Uh, Janze is free for a research team. Uh, it was paid for uh, by the government, so it is uh, free for you uh, as users. So. Uh, Idris hosted uh, many uh, supercomputers before, and that's a bit of uh, history of uh, uh, what uh, Idris hosted, but um, some of the conclusion, are, are we, we can see the same conclusion in every uh, computer centers. Uh, basically, uh, in 10 years, uh, the electrical power uh, was multiplied by roughly 10, but uh, the compute power was uh, multiplied by almost 300, so it is uh, a lot more efficient than it used to be. Uh, and uh, before Jean Zay, we had other machines, uh, blue jeans, uh, which were uh, the most um, powerful machines uh, Idris ever had because it actually was in the top 10 of uh, uh, global, uh, of the global ranking of the supercomputers. So uh, with, um, with Jean Zay, uh, you have uh, multiple partitions. So there is a CPU partition for HPC, but uh, it's not really uh, your, uh, uh, your usage. Uh, but there are many, many uh, um, GPUs, so V100 and A100. Uh, they are separated, so you can use uh, a V100 and a A100 at the same time. Um, but you can choose uh, which uh, GPU you want to use. And uh, all partitions have access uh, always uh, to uh, storage, so uh, you do not need to uh, transfer uh, your data set uh, beforehand. So uh, we have multiple uh, partitions uh, for storage. Uh, mostly we have the work partition, which is a rotative disk, uh, where you will store a smaller data set as well as code. But you also have a full flash uh, partition uh, without any uh, quota uh, for faster access. And uh, if you need to use uh, uh, any, uh, any uh, of these uh, resources, you just uh, go through Slurm. So uh, Slurm is a workload manager, uh, one of the most common ones in every supercomputer on Earth. Uh, and it is the one that we use uh, at Idris. Uh, so basically, if we do not have uh, this uh, software, the issue that uh, we have uh, is that it is complicated to launch a job on multiple nodes. Oops. Uh, and also, uh, we would have the case where every researcher would use uh, GPU zero and uh, the other one would remain idle. Uh, so Slurm manages uh, everything for us. And there is a fair share algorithm to uh, ensure that everyone has, uh, has a fair usage uh, of the supercomputers. So to log in on Janze is just a, a regular machine, so you can just go through SSH and then just launch your job. Or you can go uh, through uh, uh, Jupyter Hub, which is a, a portal to make it uh, easier and uh, more intuitive uh, to use uh, su the supercomputers. So you can just uh, do your uh, Slurm uh, submission with Jupyter Hub uh, and ask for resources from there. And then uh, when you will be, uh, when you will have your allocation, you can start notebooks. So you will have a, a more visual uh, usage of uh, the computer. So uh, what are the services uh, given by Idris? So we have courses, uh, HPC as well as AI. Uh, we have also short-term and uh, long-term support uh, for research team which may require it. Uh, because uh, some team may not have engineers, they may have only uh, researchers and need, would need uh, engineers to help them. And then we, we, uh, we provide tools and environments such as Conda, JupyterHub, and uh, also uh, the DSDR. So DSDR is a, um, a storage space uh, where we uh, download a data set, so you do not need to download it, uh, especially if uh, they are uh, 
terabytes of data, we do it and uh, we put it in common so we only do it once. Which could be very, uh, which is very important, uh, especially for computer vision, but also natural language processing. So uh, that's the interest team. So uh, the the parts that you may uh, see uh, is uh, green columns, which is a, a support team. So there is the HPC support team and the AI support team, uh, which we belong to, uh, to help you use. Um, uh, the supercomputer, and there are also uh, many other people which uh, uh, we which we do not see, but uh, which actually uh, make uh, the machine work. So the mission of the support team is uh, the help desk. So if you have an issue, you can send us an email, but we also uh, answer uh, the phone uh, if you need it. Uh, we manage the software, so you do not have to compile uh, it uh, by yourself. We provide uh, support and documentation. And then the, there is training workshops uh, and Akasan if you need help. So th uh, those are the training courses that we offer currently. So there are many, many HPC uh, courses, uh, a few AI courses. So for instance, introduction to deep learning. So you're probably beyond that, but that's still a thing. Uh, and uh, courses about optimized deep learning uh, to make the most out of uh, our resources. And uh, one of our biggest one is uh, the Fiddle one, which is uh, free and online, uh, which covers uh, many, many uh, themes in artificial intelligence. Uh, finally, uh, one thing that we have at Idris and many other centers is the Penria Engineers Network. So uh, it's uh, 20 engineers uh, which are available uh, as support for any team, uh, any research team which. Uh, would need it, uh, then you would just uh, submit a, a, a project and uh, if you need an AI engineer, uh, you would be allocated someone for like three months uh, and uh, it would help you uh, use your uh, code on supercomputers and maybe do some uh, development for you. So when you come to, uh, to Jean Zay, there are many, many uh, thematic committees uh, which help um, allocate re uh, resources and give you uh, uh, hours. Uh, so the biggest one is uh, the last one, artificial intelligence, because Jean Zay is now mainly an artificial intelligence supercomputers. But for HPC, there are basically every, uh, every research uh, field is uh, represented. A few examples of things uh, which run on uh, Jean Zay. So there is AlphaFold. So AlphaFold is a, a famous code uh, to uh, do some prediction uh, about molecules. Uh, so it was not trained on Jean Zay, but it is very often uh, used uh, uh, for inference on Jean Zay, uh, mainly by uh, the uh, Institut Pasteur. Uh, and there are a few uh, ne networks which were trained and are somewhat famous. So there is DeepFone, which is used uh, by national parks to recognize uh, animals. There is PlantNet also, which was trained on Jean Zay since the beginning, uh, where you can take pictures of plants and it recognizes uh, the kind. And there is uh, the biggest one, so Big Science, uh, which is uh, some, uh, it trains uh, the model Bloom. So um, it is somewhat called by media as the French uh, chatbot, uh, although it is neither French nor a chatbot. Uh, and uh, it was uh, an international uh, work uh, with uh, more than uh, a thousand researchers, but it was trained on Jean Zay uh, for like three months. Uh, and uh, it resulted in a large language model. So uh, just to show you that it is possible on Jean Zay to train very, very large models, uh, which you may need in your work. So uh, what's the conclusion about uh, all this Jean Zay project? So uh, basically it was found that uh, we have more than a thousand projects, so it's working pretty well. Uh, so you may, uh, so we may be trustworthy. Uh, and most of it is uh, uh, dynamic access AI for faster. Uh, if you want an access on Jean Zay, uh, usually the AI community wants it fast. So we introduced uh, dynamic access to uh, go much faster. And it's working so well that uh, Jean Zay was extended uh, actually three times, the last one with the A100 uh, partitions, uh, which added uh, eight petaflops. 
Uh, and uh, when there was a survey, so it was found that 20% of AI researchers were using Jean Zay and 93% were satisfied. Uh, there is still work because 30% were not aware of the existence of Jean Zay, so there is still work to do uh, to communicate about Jean Zay. Uh, so it is a quite a su successful uh, project uh, to help researchers, so that's why we are talking about it, uh, because you may need uh, the resources uh, of uh, Idris. Uh, and yeah, so Jean Zay uh, is successful, so it is a uh, it, it does make uh, Gen C a bit more trustworthy for uh, uh, future supercomputers. So you may have heard that uh, France uh, has obtained from Europe uh, fun, uh, funding for uh, an exascale supercomputer. So it will be uh, also purchased by Gen C. Uh, this time it will be hosted not by Idris and CNRS, it will be uh, hosted by uh, CA uh, because only they have uh, the electrical facilities to uh, power such machine. Uh, but uh, Jean Zay will, uh, will keep living and uh, will be updated with uh, new, uh, newer hardware uh, to train a larger model um, much faster. Uh, so to get access uh, to Jean Zay, it is quite easy. Uh, there is um, a website uh, made by Gensi called idari.fr and uh, you uh, you can ask for uh, you can submit a project and ask for GPU hours uh, on this uh, on this website. So depending on the amount of uh, of uh, resources that you need, you will have two procedures. If it is uh, below fifty thousand uh, GPU hours, it's considered as a small uh, as a small uh, allocation. So uh, it will go faster, it will be a dynamic access and you will have your resources uh, within a week. Uh, it, if it's more than that, uh, you will go through a regular access, which is uh, twice per year, and the uh, allocation committees will review your project, but then you can ask for much more resources. Either way, you will uh, go through, um, uh, you will require uh, an access uh, because uh, Jean Zay is a restricted uh, area, so it all it is always possible to, go, to be denied. Uh, that's a thing to keep in mind, but uh, most of the times people do obtain uh, their uh, authorization. Uh, and now uh, Atim and uh, Pierre will talk about NLP uh, more specifically. Thanks, uh, Nathan. Uh, hello, everyone. So just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, uh, as we have some time, so <laughs> feel free. Uh, so for this part, we are going to present you the work we have done during the PLM, PLM for All project. So this is the project we, uh, under the format of uh, advanced support we had uh, at Idris. And we were four engineers working with uh, researchers to make um, uh, the use of uh, Jean Zay, especially for people using uh, large models, uh, easy. So, quick summary, we're going to talk about uh, data parallelism, accelerate, parameter efficient fine tuning, and uh, then a team will uh, uh, present you uh, naive model parallelism and pipeline parallelism, and uh, DSPs and Megatron. So, the first thing, uh, I don't know if uh, you are very familiar with this, I think uh, you are quite uh, <laughs> familiar, but just, re just a quick reminder. Uh, in the context of uh, supercomputer, we have uh, different nodes. Uh, I took the example of uh, four GPU per node. And uh, in uh, PyTorch, historically, so before we had a data parallel class to use multi GPUs for uh, one model. Uh, with the data parallel class, you had only one process. So the process is a MPI task. Uh, usually on Jose, so you had only one process that could use uh, all the four GPUs to, uh, um, uh, to do a data parallelism on uh, the model. But if your model is uh, too large and does not fit on one GPU, uh, you cannot use this uh, class to do uh, data parallelism. So we use a distributed data parallel class. So uh, it is uh, no uh, recommended even if uh, your model fits on one GPU, because uh, he uses uh, MPI backend and is uh, faster uh, 
uh, to do the communications between uh, the, the processes. And uh, it works if your uh, uh, model does not fit on one GPU. And it also works uh, in uh, multi-node configurations. Uh, so that's all for the data parallelism. Uh, for the implementation on Jose, we have a, a Python package, which is IDR Torch. Uh, so this package uh, must be added uh, in your code. And uh, what it does basically, it defines the master addr and master port variables for your script. So uh, you don't uh, need to manually set them uh, according to the nodes that uh, has been allocated to you. And then uh, you also recover some uh, variables uh, that are useful for enduring your scripts and uh, make them av uh, available for you in uh, your Python code. So you can just uh, ask for uh, idrtorch.rank or .size to have the world size and uh, things like that. So uh, uh, to init your process, uh, you have uh, the torch.distributed um, package and then you we, uh, we tell a user to use the uh, nickel backend because this is uh, the one we have and uh, it is uh, um, more efficient on uh, Jean Zay. Uh, then, uh, so this is a distributed sampler and data loader uh, uh, that you can uh, initialize with the idr torch dot size and dot rank uh, variables. Yes. For this, uh, I think uh, yes, uh, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so it is not uh, very uh, specifically uh, for Jean Zay. Uh, it is uh, for any cluster and uh, it recovers variables environments, uh, variables that are set by Slurm. So if you have another cluster who uses Slurm, you can use uh, the script that is also available online. And uh, yes, uh, also all the work uh, I am uh, uh, presenting to you is also uh, publicly available on the PLM for all uh, Git, uh, which you can uh, see a link uh, here. So um, uh, it is, uh, I think, available for all the Slum cluster. Uh. The script uh, that we provide on that Git, it's uh, made for Jean Zay, uh, basically. But I think you can easily adapt it uh, to your uh, cluster. OK, thanks, Atim. Um. OK, so another thing uh, we worked on is uh, how to use uh, the Hugging Face uh, library Accelerate on Jean Zay. Uh, we had uh, quite a struggle for, <laughs> uh, for the implementation because we didn't understand that we need a config file for each node in the, the process. So we made a script uh, that creates uh, those files. Uh, and uh, uh, here it is, so it is available on the PLM uh, Git. And uh, then to launch your script, you just need to uh, as run batch accelerate launch uh, with the config file uh, that you set accordingly. So as you can see here, uh, we took a very basic uh, configuration. So uh, for no uh, you you would need to edit this file if you want to uh, add, for example, the deep speed uh, config uh, in your script. So this is a work in progress, and uh, we haven't tested uh, every accelerate features uh, now. So it is a uh, we are going to test it uh, during the, <laughs> the few months, and. Um, so there is also a Megatron LM config and a FSDP config. Now, uh, on your script, uh, what does uh, Accelerate do is uh, that uh, it's uh, only a wrapper that uh, you um, put your model optimizer, data loader, and scheduler in. And then it handles for you all the data placement, for example, so you don't need to uh, take care of the model to uh, GPU. So it does it for you, and they know where your model is, where your data is, and where your data need to be. 
only for uh, classical training. If you have uh, uh, data that needs to, to be on, uh, on a particular GPU, uh, you need to set it yourself. Um, so uh, it replaces all the uh, distributed data parallel lines of code that we saw before, also. Um, then there is another hugging face library we worked on. This is the PEFT library. So PEFT stands for Parameter Efficient Fine Tuning. It is mainly used for LLMs uh, nowadays. Uh, and we also, uh, so we, we created a module on Janze. So this is not available on all cluster for this module. Uh, this is just a Conda environment where we uh, put all the um, uh, all the Python package uh, useful for training LLMs, and uh, we update them uh, very regularly. So they are also they are always up to date. And so if you want to test new features, uh, it's uh, the module you need. And then uh, on the PEFT uh, library. Uh, there is a huge uh, 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 programming effort made by Hugging Face uh, for now. Uh, and they already implemented the uh, LoRa and QLoRa that are um, uh, an adaptator techniques. And uh, the paper is very recent. And uh, for example, they are the only one who implemented them uh, in the library for now. So if you want to use it with another library, we need to rewrite the code from the paper. So. That's something they did, and uh, they also work uh, with uh, their other library with Accelerate, so it is compatible with uh, DSpeed and uh, fully shared data parallelism. And they are also implemented other uh, uh, parameter efficient fighting techniques that are prompt tuning, perfect tuning, p tuning, and EA3. So now uh, I will let Atim uh, speak to you. Uh, so before I start my part, um, as uh, Pierre said, PLM for Rose, it's in work in progress. So if you have a suggestion, suggestion about tools that we uh, didn't present, uh, you can tell us because at the end of PLM for All, what we want to do, it's a huge benchmark of every tool. And uh, we show uh, which, on Janze, uh, which tools are the best to fine tune model or even for inference for model. So if you have suggestion about tools, just uh, you can tell us at the end. So now my part, I'll start with uh, model parallelism. So as, uh, as you know, when the model is too big uh, to fit in one device, like for example Bloom, you need to do uh, what we call uh, model parallelism. So you have to know that with a uh, uh, with a QLoRa, uh, so which quantize uh, two times uh, a model, even Bloom uh, can fit in one device. So uh, I think Lama can fit in one device, but even with a double qu quantization, you can't um, fit Bloom on uh, one device, so you still need model parallelism. So the first technique I'll show is uh, the naive model parallelism. So it's the simplest way to do it. Uh, you just slice your model in different parts. You put different parts in uh, your different device, and then you compute sequentially uh, the forward and the backward uh, of your training. So as you can see, it's very inefficient because like the whole white space that we have, it's a GPU waiting. And uh, as you can know, GPU compute, it's very expensive. So it's the kind of thing that we don't want to do. But in case you want to do it anyway, uh, there is a very easy way to do it. So first with PyTorch. When uh, you in, in instantiate, uh, when you create your model, you just have to put your different parts uh, of your model into different device. And in your forward, you just pass, pass, the, just pass the result of uh, one uh, device to the other one. With Accelerate, it's even simpler. You just have, uh, when you do your front pre-train, you just have to add device map. Uh, and then the way you want to be uh, uh, your model to be, uh, to be sliced. So for example, there's auto automatically. And then uh, Accelerate will automatically uh, put different part of your model into different device. But it's uh, still very, 
inefficient, it's very slow, so you, you should use it like, for example, uh, if you, uh, if you want, just want to try a model quickly. But uh, if you want to do fine tuning or uh, other things, like I really don't advise you to uh, use, that, use this. So there is an even better uh, way to do model parallelism, which is uh, pipeline parallelism. Uh, the best, uh, well, the first uh, method is uh, what we call G-pipe. Basically, you kind of uh, do uh, the naive parallelism, but with a gradient accumulation in a smarter way. So uh, you uh, slice your batch into uh, different parts, and uh, you synchronously compute uh, your uh, your uh, forward and backward uh, loop as uh, always. So this is a way to do it uh, with PyTorch with the RPC uh, module. So uh, that I put here, it's. Um, how can I say, it's still a bit easy uh, to use it. The only problem is first, uh, you have to use it within one node, so it's not working on different nodes. And also you have uh, to initialize uh, the RPC backend correctly. For example, on Janze, we had to find that it's this option that we have to use and not the default one. Then uh, how you do it, you just uh, make uh, a list of your different layer or even uh, in a sequential uh, module and then you pass, you pass it to the pipe uh, module of uh, PyTorch and then you have uh, your, uh, your model uh, with pipeline. A more optimized way to do it, it's with a pipe dream, a pipe dream flush, uh, which is uh, the Default uh, pipeline parallelism used by deep speed. So I'll talk a bit about this speed. Uh, so as you can see, the bubble is even uh, smaller, so it's uh, even more optimized. Um, so I'll talk a bit about this speed and how you initialize it on Janze. So normally, if you use deep speed uh, before, um, you should have used the deep speed launcher. Uh, but on Janze, I think it's more practical to directly use uh, what we call the MPI search environment. So basically, you, you use the command srun to execute uh, several times your Python code. And then when you initialize your distribution with this speed, you just put, well, the NCCL backend because we're on Janze and it's what's it's best uh, on Janze. And then the init uh, method with env. And basically, it will automatically find uh, every GPU uh, that you'll use for that training. So it will, if you do pipeline parallelism, it will directly uh, slice your model uh, into the right device. So it's what we advise. Do not use uh, the, la the deep speed launcher, but use the uh, SRUN. Uh, but of course, you can still use uh, the deep speed launcher. It's not, uh, you can still use it on Janvay. So after you initialize um, uh, deep speed, uh, there's several ways actually to do uh, pipeline parallelism. Here I've, I uh, did the way, I show the way with uh, the pipeline module of uh, deep speed. So basically you create a class and then in that in initialization of that class, you initialize, uh, well, you cut your, your model on different parts and then um, and then, well, we'll see uh, just after how we instantiate that model, but you just have uh, to have like a list of the different layers that you can slice. So basically, if you use a, a transformer model, usually the first layer will be the embedding, then you'll have all the transformer layer, and then maybe at the end you have a linear layer. So you can put all that on the list and give it uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the list. Uh, just a little tip too, um, you can use what we call smart loading uh, on um, when you use a pipeline parallelism. It's because if you don't uh, use a smart loading, you know, uh, because we execute several times the code, if you uh, load, for example, a big model Bloom on uh, a GPU, it will load eight times uh, the model on the CPU RAM. So a way to pass that is to use what we call layer spec uh, and basically you just wrap uh, your, your part of the model on the layer spec to uh, basically do uh, what we call smart loading. 
after we do that, so you can instantiate um, your, uh, your model with all uh, the different parameters that you're going to use. Also, you can use how uh, which partition method you want to use. Basically, here I choose uniform. It means like it will treat each layer of the module of the model uh, like the same. Um, it will not be, for example, a smart way to do it with uh, Bloom because the embedding layer is way bigger than the transformer layer, so it will take more space. But uh, it's just to show it. So yes, and then you. Um, you put your model on a uh, deep speed initialize to uh, start to get your model engine and basically with this speed it's uh, how you do the forward and backward it's uh, with uh, that model engine and of course you give the deep speed configuration also another way uh, to manage your uh, gpu memory in a smarter way is to use uh, what we call deep speed zero Deep Speed Zero, uh, there's so several stages of Deep Speed Zero. The first stage will simply um, uh, slice the states of the optimizer. So it's very useful, for example, if you use Adam optimizer, because uh, the Adam optimizer, uh, there's way more weight uh, than uh, you know, uh, the gradient and uh, the weight of the model. The second stage will uh, slice also uh, the gradient, and the last stage, the stage three, will slice even the weight, uh, the weight of the model. And so uh, each device will have just one part of the model of the weight and of the model of the gradient and uh, the optimizer. So to do it. Um, in Janze, it's pretty easy actually uh, when you know how to initialize uh, deep speed. You just write your config. So as you can see, I put like basic config with a uh, microbyte size, uh, Adam, etc. I use the BFCs because it's better on uh, A100. And then I choose uh, the stage that I want to use. So one, two, or three. Then uh, I initialize, of course, uh, deep speed like I used to do. And there's a tip here to do uh, smart loading uh, when you use um, a hugging face uh, model is to simply call the training arguments class of, uh, uh, of um, hugging face. Then it will use the smart loading that I talked before. Uh, and what hugging face do actually is they, they use uh, the deep speed uh, zero init context to do uh, the smart loading. So then uh, you call your model like Ojoel always, and then you just pass in the deep speed initialize uh, function uh, the model that you just load. And to finish, I'll call I'll talk a bit about Megatron. So Megatron, the major advance. Uh, that the well the the best uh, quality of Megatron, I think it's uh, what uh, they call the tensor parallelism. Um, basically, you not uh, you not slice your model into um, how can I say part vertically, but it, it depends on how you see the model. Let's say like you not slice the model at uh, between um, between layers, but actually you cut the layer into uh, different uh, matrices. So as you can see, uh, what the tensor parallelism do, they just cut the different matrices and do uh, twice. For example, if it's two device, you'll do uh, twice uh, the, um, uh, the compute on each device. Then you uh, put in common a first time here, uh, don't, uh, sorry, here uh, your result. And then you'll pass uh, to the uh, next part and do the same. So as you can see, there's two all reduce operation. And because of that, uh, tensor parallelism is better when you use it within a node because, uh, on Janze I'm talking, because uh, within a node we have what uh, we call the NV links, which is a very efficient uh, link between GPUs. But when you are uh, between nodes, uh, pipeline parallelism become more optimized because uh, there is less compute between device. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's better when we have NVLink, but uh, between nodes, it's kind of hard. 
So how to use Megatron is kind of easy actually when uh, when you know how to instantiate it. So basically, you just choose uh, your Slurm uh, your Slurm parameter, and then you use the S run to uh, to execute uh, your mega your Megatron uh, several times. So for example, here I tried it on a fine tuning task, and I just use so eight. Uh, a factor of eight for tensor parallelism and two of pipeline model parallelism. Why? Simply because I have a GPU within a node, so I'll do tensor parallelism within the node with that. And we I have two nodes, so I want to do pipeline parallelism between the two nodes, so I do that. And then I also use uh, that backend because it's the best on uh, on Jonze. And a last way to do a tensor parallelism is to use deep speed inference, which is, uh, I think, it's uh, the best, yeah, it's the more optimized way to do inference uh, on big NLP model. So you initialize the deep speed uh, like we saw it before. You can call the model uh, in a smart way or not like we saw it before, and then we just so call uh, the that class we change the attribute of uh, world size. Here you can use uh, IDR, IDR torch world size to know the number of GPU. And then you pass uh, your configuration into uh, the init inference, and you can do your, your inference like you, you will do it. And um, that way, so we tried, and it's this one who is the more optimized on Jose for uh, inference. Um little summary of uh, so what which tool can do what so as you can see uh, every tool you can do a DDP with it you can do a pipeline parallelism with PyTorch but only on one node on accelerate so as you can see it's still a work in progress so we didn't try a lot of things and for example on accelerate uh, they said that we can use deep speed zero and Megatron uh, PP and TP but uh, we didn't try it yet, and we didn't see actually a lot of code uh, on it, so actually we're curious. If you used PP, TP, and zero on, uh, with Accelerate, uh, if you can tell us uh, at the end, uh, we'll, we'll be interested. Um, then pipeline parallelism, as you can see, uh, we can use it on DPC, but it's kind of hard uh, to implement it. Uh, so we suggest to pass into Megatron if you want to use that. Tensor parallelism, if you use inference, uh, no brainer, it's to use deep speed, but uh, for training, maybe, uh, yeah, Megatron is the best, I think. And also, something that we didn't talk about, it's uh, there is a version of Megatron which is deep speed Megatron, and you can use so uh, TP, well, DDP, PP, TP, and zero stage one. Actually, it's uh, with all that configuration that uh, Bloom was trained on Jonze, and the big science team. Uh, told us that, uh, well, it's the most op optimized way to do it uh, on Jose. Um, also, something that we didn't talk about, it's uh, the PEFT technique uh, that Pierre showed are, um, are compatible with some uh, techniques that we show. For example, you can use the zero stage one and two with uh, QLoRa. So, for example, uh, if uh, your model is too big or for training, but it should be very big. Uh, or even if you want to do a data parallelism with QLoRa, QLoRa, if it's still not, if it's still too slow to use QLoRa. So yes, um, and that's it. And uh, at the end, so we hope that we'll have a, a benchmark of every method with every tool. Uh, that way you can know which uh, which way it's the most optimized way to do it uh, on Jose. And that's it. Thank you. Any question? So I will start with one because the um, well, Jean Zay is obviously a French uh, HPC, and uh, it's easy for French to use. Uh, we know that in the room we have some people from uh, outside France who are using it. Um, but we also can use uh, other European uh, clusters, like I know there's one in Sweden that we can use, but 
are there good ways to collaborate? Um, what's the network actually of uh, HPC centers in Europe or in the world? Because as researchers, you have people from many countries and uh, it's so easy when you can share the facilities to collaborate, like data, models and everything. So how can we do um, to collaborate like this? Uh, currently, there is no real network uh, worldwide. Uh, we are trying, uh, but uh, it's still uh, uh, a lot of work to do to, uh, to do something, uh, but it would be within France. So basically, well, one idea would be to share data sets between Jean Zay and Adastra and the future uh, exascale supercomputer Jules Verne. Uh, but uh, mostly, it's still very difficult, and uh, such st structure, there is, I don't think there is uh, any uh, advanced uh, structure which would do that. So maybe I'm f asking the same follow-up question. I'm kind of wondering how many people in the room could benefit from this talk. I mean, it seems like I gather this is unavailable to most of us. Is that right? No? It's not unavailable to, uh, to most of you. Actually, the idea of Jean Zay is that it is available to all of you. So uh, we would, uh, you would need to, uh, to ask for resources on Jean Zay. Uh, but then uh, Jean Zay is open and it's free. Uh, and then you would uh, be able to use uh, everything uh, that we installed on Jean Zay? Uh, yes, uh, and so there is uh, uh, something that the government is uh, investing in Jean Zay and uh, uh, one of the uh, points that you need to have uh, to access Jean Zay is that your laboratory needs to have uh, the French government in uh, one of the uh, um uh, uh, the one uh, giving money. Uh, so that's one of the parts that... Uh so, in other words, it's unavailable. I mean, right? So which part, actually? Like, Jean Zay or... Pierre I don't have a grant from because the French government, right? Yeah, but yeah. you know that last part, PLM for all, it's available for everyone. So we oh. provide easy script uh, to do all the techniques that we show, and it's a, 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 a public GitLab, so you can use it. And the benchmark will be on Jean Zay, obviously, so you know which one is the best on Jean Zay. But uh, you can take into account uh, which compute that we have on Jean Zay, and then, uh, I don't know, like uh, it, it will be a first um, hint on which one will be best on your cluster. Yeah, and maybe additionally, um, to be on Jean Zay, actually, you need to have, I think you have, need to have French partners. But if I'm correct, for the Bloom project, there were how many countries involved? You, you said it before. And there was no uh, general funding, like one agency funding everybody. So it was really a collaborative project. Correct me if I'm wrong. Eh? But collaborative project in which institutions from all over the world benefited from the infrastructure. So like there was Hugging Face, uh, there were uh, the, um, uh, universities from US, for instance, involved in the project. And so that's, uh, that's one way to collaborate. Of course, you have restrictions regarding the security, uh, and uh, some people in the room know that. <laughs> but I, I think that's a good way to collaborate also, so that's why we are pushing to get uh, the infrastructure available for international projects. Any question regarding the availability maybe, or the techniques used, or politic questions? <laughs> Maybe one question that might be on the minds of people who are not fr in French institutions, like you know, either US or other European countries or even Malaysia. What is a model for partnering with someone in this way? In other words, how are these consortia formed? So let's say I'm not worried about, I'm not thinking about what to do in the next two weeks for JSOL. I'm thinking in the next three months, can I write some application so that for the follow-on work that I want to do from JSALT, I can use these resources. So is there an existing successful model or some partnership, or do you want to say how one might build one? I, this might not be a question for you, I don't know. Maybe it is for you, but imagine that I'm at Johns Hopkins in the US, right? And I would like to do some experiments which might require this kind of computing. 
So what is my path? What's an example saying, look, this other person from Boston University did X, so do something similar. Find a French university partner, I don't know. Can you point me to something and say this is how you use it? So that's what I think Ken is saying. He doesn't see how he, as a researcher in Northeastern University in the US, can use this computing. So I think the answer he's looking for is, here is the recipe, here is the model, here's a par past partnership where somebody in America was able to use John C. Yeah, on our side, what we can say is, if you have a French partner, you can ask for uh, that kind of compute. You okay. go to this website that we show, you explain your project, right. and you can have it. <laughs> okay. Yes, so that is true. So it is a French national investment and, okay. Yeah, you, you need French partner, that's true. Uh, so actually, I thought there was a European, um, a European policy to develop some uh, European re uh, computation center so that we can access. I know as a French researcher, we can access a uh, supercomputer in other countries and uh, without any partnership. But definitely in France, if you want to access this, uh, you need to have a, you just collaborate. There's no need to have a funding like a NSF uh, binational project, for instance. You just have a research project that you describe. You make a, it's a, a proposal for two, four pages. And, uh, and then you get the facilities to compute. And the good thing is you can really have multi, multiple nationalities uh, involved. Evidence but is that I'm assuming the evidence is that there are non-French people using this at, at JSALT, so. QED. Yeah. So again, it's, it, uh, there are some restrictions about security, but yes, definitely uh, it's possible. And I... Uh, <laughs> about the access from foreign people, I just have a question and maybe just yeah, some people of our group are wondering why uh, some nationalities are banned from Jean Zay, like Argentina, for instance, to say it only them. I, even if they are involved in the European project and in the JSOL project. So I don't know if I, I, I'm, it, it's not your domain, I think, but if you have any clue, <laughs> it will help maybe. Yeah, o officially, there's no nationality ban for, from Jean Zay. Officially, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are no nationalities which are banned. If, uh, we have also Chinese uh, researchers uh, on Jose. Uh, but uh, the French government uh, has a, uh, gave itself the right uh, to deny any uh, application. And uh, they do not provide any kind of justification. Uh, that's the policy, no justification ever. Uh, so if someone is refused, uh, so I don't know uh, about uh, Argentina, uh, maybe there was another reason, but uh, we cannot know, and uh, they will not answer this kind of question. They refuse. I, I, I also would like to share an experience. I, I don't know others, but I submit a few times, and every time if you ask, tell me I miss a document, and then I resubmit, and then you tell me I miss another document. So I end up, I, I, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe uh, this can be, uh, uh, I mean, can be managed a bit better. Yeah, th there is a, a new procedure that is uh, being uh, created, so uh, it is more uh, st streamlined and straightforward, so it will no longer be a SAV, but uh, another software uh, to help uh, with this kind of procedure. But Yes, uh, they also recently updated the diary website, so that every uh, person who asks for resources can know the state of the project and is uh, something is missing, is can see on the direct website. So that was the point many user uh, told about uh, uh, was a problem, a non problem. I know it's the which is tentative to solve it by uh, giving more information to people who want to access. So where the the state of the the application is. Any other question? Yeah. So, uh, you think John Zay will be part of uh, Euro HPC in the future? Uh, Euro HPC is for uh, the new Exascale <coughs> supercomputer, uh, Jules Verne. I don't think uh, John Zay uh, will be part of it. Thanks. 
We heard the word supercomputer a bunch, but I don't really know what that means. Um, back in the day, you know, Cray computers were building these things that were extremely expensive and um, um, really quite leading edge. Um, but they actually never built very many of them. And I used to say I wouldn't use a computer I could afford. Um, but at some point, you know, my wife came home with a computer we could afford. And it was really better than the computer I'd used 10 years earlier. Um, and Bob Mercer, in his <laughs> Lifetime Achievement Award talk at ACL, compared a Cray um, back in the day to the cell phone he had at that time. And um, the Cray was heavier. Um, but in fact, the Cray was not competitive in any way <laughs> with the cell phone. And I think the lesson to come here there was a friend of mine who was starting a supercomputer business back in the 70s and 80s, and he thought that um, he was competing with Cray, but he actually got beaten by PCs. That PCs were, uh, he thought there were diseconomies of scale. The computing was cheaper, faster, better in smaller computers than bigger computers. And um, my economist friends told me that he didn't understand economies of scale. Economies of scale are not about the size of the computer, they're about the size of the market. So if you're building a one-of computer, it's not going to be competitive. And so what I'm wondering is here, is this basically just a, you know, a, a cluster? Is it, just, you know, is it just using commodity parts very reasonable? Or is it doing like what Cray is doing these days, which is building a one-of, biggest, baddest thing, that will not be competitive for very long. Uh, yes, uh, so usually the supercomputers that are built have a lifetime of around five to six years. So they are usually at uh, the top uh, of in terms of performances uh, when they are installed, and then they decrease uh, with the time because uh, the computers are always more and more powerful. So uh, the main um, usage of uh, Supercomputers is that uh, you, there are some things that you can do on supercomputers that you can do on your PC. For example, training a very big model, you need uh, many nodes with uh, a very strong inter interconnection uh, between the nodes to exchange data. So that's something you have only on uh, supercomputers. Actually, the difference between supercomputer and like maybe da data center like cluster, classical, it's the connection between the different device. It's that uh, that uh, we pay the most, and that's why we consider that a uh, supercomputer and like another thing, uh, a data center. It's the connection between the device. Uh, I think uh, within a node, uh, you are at uh, something like uh, 600 uh, gigabytes uh, between GPUs uh, because of the NVLink uh, communications. Right. It is a bit slower when you're leaving the node because uh, you're not using uh, NVLink, uh, but you're using Omnipath network, which is a bit slower, although it is uh, more flexible. Yeah, but NVLink is limited to a very small number of GPUs, right? I can't use, I mean, they don't connect. You're not going to count get thousands of GPUs connected that way, are you? No, no, it's uh, limited to a node. That's why uh, TensorPower releasing. Yeah, releasing. I understand. A node is like a tiny number of GPUs, right? It's usually eight, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So within eight, all right, you get that speed, right? Okay, fine. Th right. That's but why we normally consider that to be just one machine. Well, uh, the idea is that um, still the uh, Omnipass network is much faster than we would have uh, on any data center. That's why it's considered as one big computer rather than a thousand on smaller one. And uh, yeah, the fact that NVLink is much faster, uh, that's why we take it into account uh, when we're doing uh, parallelism. Uh, the paradigm uh, changes uh, depending on the, the number of GPU and the configuration we have. That's why. We use tensor parallelism within the node because it's communication heavy, and then pipeline parallelism across nodes. So there are differences, but it's still much faster than uh, consumer grade computers.
questions? <laughs> So, so just before, uh, actually, when, when uh, um, I understand that for non-French people, uh, it seems very far and maybe not very useful actually to know the French facilities. But when uh, when discussing with uh, different partners, it's very difficult, I think, to know what kind of infrastructure is available if you want to collaborate with other countries, other partners, uh, what exists in other countries. I mean, even in France, I'm not sure I, I know everything about the facilities we have. And I, I thought that... Um, there's really some kind of value here to exchange on these topics because uh, I think there are good practices, there are ideas there. Uh, in the framework of JSOLT workshop, uh, when we are talking about collaboration, I think everybody's struggling in the groups. Uh, I mean, Ken, you're the first because you were asking for USB sticks with five terabytes at some point. Yeah, and <laughs> really? Ah, yeah, definitely, yes. Um, the security blocks here are my numbers, um, to the point where I actually do all the transfers in my partner. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so we could, we could certainly discuss, but I've used, I've, I mean, I had a, a, a Slurm cluster in my university, also had one at Bayview. Mm -hmm. The stuff that's being described here, we all had that at Bayview for sure. Lots of GPUs, nice network within the pod. One of the things that I have at Northeastern that I never had at Baidu is lots of disk space and lots of RAM. Maybe not so many GPUs, but disk space and RAM are cheap and really valuable. GPUs are expensive, and I'm not so impressed. Right? They're not that much faster mm -hmm. than CPUs, and I'd rather have a thousand CPUs than ten GPUs. I mean, than ten CPUs. Being able to allocate an array of terabytes is really very, very useful. Um, so I, I'm worried this is sort of, and one of the thinking we had back in the day, Slurm is kind of how people would do things five years ago. But these days, I think people are moving more toward AWS kind of model. I worry this is not that leading edge. So it'd be interesting to really do a comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll let this for the discussions after. <laughs> if there's no other question. Uh, just about yeah. that, uh, there's a big difference is that John is free, totally free uh, for no, researcher. Oh, no, no, it's available for some people. It doesn't mean that, uh, yeah. but it's free for the people who are available. I mean, if you're in Northeastern, our network's free too. Um, oh, yeah, maybe. I didn't say that. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Thank <laughs> you.